Welcome to the second episode of the story behind the story of the murder of Selena Quintanilla. We have here Maria Celeste Arreras, who we've already shown you in the first episode, is the authority on this case. And today we're going to be talking about that fateful day, that day the tragedy happened, uh, the day that Selena got shot, the day that Selena died, and the day that Maria Celeste's career essentially changed forever. So Maria Celeste, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. I'll never forget that March 31st, 1995. And yes, my career changed, um, but it, it didn't change right away. It, it took a long time. I, I, it's not like that day anything miraculous happened. From day to the Yeah, right. and, and, mm -hmm. and again, I, I was very established back then, but it changed in the sense that I, I was able to, to demonstrate that I was a very serious journalist that could do very thorough work. Did you have an opportunity prior to that uh, to you know, dive into a case like this? I've had had uh, many cases that I got into pretty much, but not at this level. No, right, no. right. So where were you precisely when you found out that Selena was shot? We heard somebody scream, Selena has been shot. Somebody screamed that. And when that happened, we originally thought at the very beginning that they were referring to Selena, not Selena. Selena was a, a psychic. Uh, that lived in Miami. Gotcha. And the reason why we were thinking that is because like two weeks before another psychic had been killed. So we figure, oh my God, there's like a serial, a serial killer. killer. Yeah, of psychics. So, so you know, we already started with a conspiracy theory. And then somebody said, no, 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 it's not Selena, it's Selena, the Tex-Mex queen. And we're like in shock when we heard that. Wow, what was going on through your head at that moment? Well, the first thing I thought was how bad is it? Mm -hmm. You know, wh where did it happen? Why? Who did it? We, we didn't have any details at the very beginning, except she was shot. And then we started to call everybody in Corpus Christi that we knew that we had all the contacts there to, to start finding out what was going on. And soon after, little details started to come out. She had been shot and she was not in very good condition. Now, how did you know that what you were reporting was true? You know, well, things were happening so quickly. Absolutely, because we had, first of all, we had people we have a correspondent in, in Corpus that immediately went to the, to the motel where she had been shot. Okay. And then once that happened, you know, everything that we were getting was firsthand from her being on the scene. And I also, you know, from the book, you actually found out that she died while you were on camera, correct? While you were on air. Yes, because we, we, we realized that, in, that the public was very thirsty for details in, in, you know, in view of what, what had happened. So we, uh, we ran to the control room, we ran to the studio, and we were starting to give an update on what we already had said before, which is basically a little bit more details, but it was you know, like a summary of what we knew up till then. And then when I was talking about she was injured, she's in the hospital, then on the IFB, my producer said she's dead. So I realized that they had had some information that I was not uh, acquainted with and that this is something that I needed to say right there and then. So when I said it, it was, it was very, very hard. Oh my God, I got the chills. Just, I can't yeah. imagine that happening, especially like, on air. I mean, and, and, the, the moment. Yeah, especially because this was a 23 year old. This is a, a girl that was just starting to spread her wings. She had just won a Grammy. She was just, and she represented the, uh, I, I would say the dreams of so many of us Hispanics I wanted to to make it you know and, and so it was very sad when when I had to say the news now I I've heard that you actually met Selena you met her once right and you I talked to her for her like one. 30 minutes I met her like three weeks before she was killed Wow okay um, I was preparing for my TV show that was uh, live every day and she was in the same studio I mean, she was in the studio next door. She was being interviewed by some other program and she was doing her makeup right next to me. And she was in Miami because there was a street festival that is very famous every year here, like Ayocho. Right. And she was, this is incredible. She was doing the warm up concert for the opening act, which was Talia. Gotcha. So she was not even that well known back right, then. Right, of in course. The East Coast yeah, she was the opening act, she right. She was the opening mm -hmm. act. So she was there, very simple, just promoting uh, what she was going to be doing. What and did you think of her? She was very, very charismatic, very, very friendly, and and um, very open with everything. She was, and she, she had a beautiful laugh. I remember she used to laugh, and it was like gargling, you know, laughter. Right, yeah. contagious, almost. Contagious, right, yeah. yeah, for sure. Tragedies happen all the time, and crimes happen all the time, right? But in this they don't specific take off like ones, this one. right, exactly. This one, this one took off, as you're saying. When did you realize, my gosh, this is more than just this story? I think, I think the next day. The next day, because the next day, the ratings started to come in. And all of a sudden, look, I, I get goosebumps. Right. All of a sudden, all the markets are going like up, up, up. Everybody wants to know about 
what happened. I look, I really get goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because this was uh, like like a phenomenon. We saw it happen in front of our eyes. We saw how the ratings started going up, and we realized that this story, for whatever reasons, was really taking off with the public. Now, were you a mom already, or no? I wasn't. You weren't. I wasn't. You weren't. Okay. So when did you? Because uh, look, as a journalist, sometimes you've got to go in there a little bit harsh, right? Because you've got to get the facts out there. You've got to get the, you know, the information. Uh, and sometimes you maybe lose a little bit of that human side, that human touch, right? Um, how did you balance that? You know, giving well, the news, but also being a human. Well, being a human, I, it, it impacted me. I didn't have to be a mother, but it impacted me because she was so young. I mean, right. she was not a lot older than I, I mean, younger than I was. So it was like a friend got killed. Right. And, uh, and especially because I, I remember her I remember a few weeks before I had just given the news that she had won the Grammy. And a lot of people, when she won the Grammy, were saying, who is she? Where is she from? And that's when we first really heard about her. Right. And then after she's killed. I started watching international news. And in Japan, they were reporting her death. Of course. Of and course. in, the, in, the, in the, the BBC in London, everywhere. Um, so it, it became like a like month of mourning, I would say. So in the process, the networks realized that this is a story that, that everybody wanted to hear about. And precisely because nobody knew so much about her, there was so much for us to, you know, investigate. Right. And and that's how, how it happened. And everybody wanted to, to have more about Selena. And every time we would do a TV show, the ratings, it would break records. We couldn't believe it. It was like, we would look at the numbers and we'd say, this cannot be. It was a phenomenon. It was. Okay, so going back to, you know, you're now a mom, right? A mom of three. Yes. Uh, do you think you would have treated this differently on air or your investigation, you know, as a mom? No, I would have treated it exactly the same way because we, as journalists, we, we're trained right. to act a certain way. Not act, but to behave and conduct ourselves in a very professional manner, uh, objective and, and, and serious. And I would have done that no matter what my personal life, what was going on in my personal life. Uh, we, we're trained like, a, we're trained like a, I would say, like a, the doctor in an emergency room. Right, that's true. You know, if, if you have a patient and he's dying, you don't stop and say, oh my God, I feel so sorry for that's you. That's true, no. yeah. You, you basically, you know, follow your, your I, I guess, your training, and then you, you act in a very specific manner, and you say the information as you hear it in a very uh, calm, you know, manner, objective, so the public doesn't become, you know, panicked. Right. And and that's what we did. And then, of course, at the end, you, you suffer like anybody else. Of course. Uh, but when that is happening, when you're in the ER, you have to handle things differently, otherwise your patient dies. Correct. And the same thing happens with us when we're on the air uh, giving the news. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and if anyone's a professional, obviously it would be you for sure. Now, your kids are grown now, right? But Selena's music has been generational. It's gone, you know, and, and kids nowadays, you know, they're four years old singing Selena songs, yes. right? Uh, did they ever, your kids ever ask you about the investigation at all or about the book, you know, knowing that this has been such a big part of your life? Well, they're very excited about the miniseries that is based on the book. They're very TV oriented. So they, they're excited about that. And, and they, they also want to know about that part of my life that it's portrayed in this miniseries because they were not there. So they want to know what was going on when I wrote the book. At the time I was with their father and we were engaged to get married and we were you know, going through some issues because I was so devoted to this trial that I had no time for him. Imagine I had my regular show that was eight hours of work you know, and then when I finished, every night I would go home plus the weekends writing the book and investigating. So it was very tough for us, but. Obviously, we ended up getting married and having the kids, so that worked. So there it goes, yeah. right? That worked. Did you ever want to give up on the investigation? No, no, no. I, I, no, I wanted to do a good job. I, I always wanted to be a writer, uh, but I always thought I'm going to retire. When I retired, I'll become a writer in a farm full of animals, looking at the beautiful landscape, and I'll be inspired. I never realized I was going to do a book so early on in my life. Of course. So when I got, when I got the opportunity, because it was offered to me, I didn't go looking for that opportunity. It was the, the, the publisher came to me and asked me if I wanted to do it, and I had all the information. So for me, it was easy to say yes. Right. But I had never written a book, so it was like a challenge in that sense. And the timing, I had to write the book in two months. It was Two tough. months? In two months. You put yourself that timeline, or was it the publisher? Oh, the publisher, of course. Yes, I would of have course. never, I would have never done that to myself. <laughs> so I was like, "What are you no, doing to yourself?" I'm not crazy, no. <laughs> now, uh, going back to the newsroom, right? You get the information, you get on camera, you're revealing this news, right? And obviously, the authoritative figure of like being to be able to provide this news to the audience that is obviously here listening to you and believing everything that you're saying. 
in today's world, it's very different, right? We have um, hoaxes all the time yeah. about celebrity deaths. We have social media with, hatch, you know, fake news all the time on it, right? How would this have been handled today? The same way, because the, the journalists are the same. It's very unfair what's happening today. Um, this whole fake news thing. Of course, there's some fake news in the the, the social media right. and and things that are out there. But when you have a newscast, we all we do all day long is corroborate information and investigate and really, you know, really go very deeply to make sure that we're saying the right information. The 99.9 .9 of journalists are that way. Yes, and it's it's unfair what's going on with the the fake news. Agreed. Uh, Good point. I like that campaign. Yes, absolutely. You're completely right about that. Now, when it comes down to, you know, what you just said, despite all of that, do you wish you would have done anything differently as far as spreading the news or even in your investigation? No, because every single day that I was investigating, I was very responsible uh, about what I was doing. I realized that this was a tragedy. I realized that this was a young girl that, that was killed unfairly in the, in, the, in the most important moment in her life. And, and I, had to be, I had to be fair to her, number right. one. As a matter of fact, when I wrote the book, I had her picture in my desk, her picture, and I was playing her music at all times just to stay tuned in with, with my first responsibility, which was to make justice in this investigation to her, um, especially because I was already in communication with the murderer about trying to get an interview with her. And, and the murderer was very manipulative and very, uh, she could be very charming. So I didn't want to, you know, fall under the spell of the wrong, for the wrong reasons, right. you know? So I said, no, 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 let me stay focused. And th this is the victim, this is a murderer. And I just want to talk to the murderer to make sure that, that, that we hear certain things that we need to learn about. But not to write something given the version of the murderer. I wouldn't do that. This is not the version. The book is not the version of Yolanda Saldivar by no means. Right. And we're going to be touching on that uh, conversation and that interview that you had with Yolanda Saldivar uh, in the next episode because I definitely want to dive into that completely. Uh, I, I saw the entire interview and, and to say that it's fascinating and, and creepy and, uh, and, and just... I guess, intriguing all at the same time. A tough interview. Uh, and I was looking at it and I was like, I don't know how I would have handled that uh, being you in that situation. And I thought that, I mean, my kudos to you, hats off to you completely. Uh, and if anyone could have handled that, it was absolutely you, without a doubt. Thank you. Yes, for sure. So we'll be taking a look at that uh, in, the, in the next episode. Going back to the uh, investigation, right? As far as like you doing your, your research, right? And your homework on this. You took this from reporting this for, like you said, a month of mourning, right, into then on your own time taking this investigation even further, right? Uh, was did you did it ever overtake, you know, your professional or personal career? It took it overtook my personal life certainly because I had no time to do anything else, and 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 I could. I was getting very little sleep. I was working many hours. I had to do a TV show daily. So I had to try to concentrate, but I was always tired. Uh, it was eight hours of, you know, regular job, you know, my TV show, and then eight hours writing, and then very little sleep and very little time for my I personal imagine, relationships. Of so it, it was very tough at, at every level. But, but I always kept, you know, I was, my north was always that this is temporary. I mean, I, I'm going to survive this because it's temporary. And I did. And, and it's something that I, that I don't regret. So it's no secret that, you know, there was a certain point that the family wasn't too keen on you writing this book. So tell us about that. Well, I respect their opinion because they're a grieving family. You never recuperate from such a loss. But rest assured, this is a book that is serious, that is based on facts, and is done always looking at the memory of Selena and, and respectful to her memory. She's so beloved by our community that I would never do anything that would raise the most minimum uh, flag about her reputation or who she was. She was a victim, and this is very clear. And nothing that Yolanda Saldivar could say about an alleged secret would justify what she did. That, that's very important. Right. But also, journalists, we write about investigations that we conduct on high-profile cases such as this one throughout history that has happened. So, so this is not a novelty. This is something that happens all the time with the, with the Kennedys, Lincoln, James Dean, uh, Marilyn Monroe, everybody. The, the, there's a high-profile death or, or murder like in this case. Um, I mean, we, we try to get down to what actually happened. And your objective is to share the news, share the truth. No, exactly. 
exactly, and, and to and to throw light and why? Why did we lose her? Why why did something so unfair happen? Right. Uh, what 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 were the uh, circumstances so that we can prevent that in the future from happening from happening to somebody else? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Maria Celeste, thank you so much for sharing uh, about that day. Thank you for that. Thank you. On the next episode, we're going to be taking a look and discussing with Maria Celeste about her one-on-one -on -one interview with Yolanda Saldivar. That's definitely something you don't want to miss. Bueno, ya saben, ¿Qué? si les gusta lo que ven uh -huh. aquí presente, estamos lindos. Suscríbanse. Pero ¿no? ya les hemos dicho tantas veces, ¿Tantas suscríbanse. Vez? Aparte es que es gratis. Claro. Que no Hoy en día nada es gratis. Tantas veces que le hemos dicho, por favor, suscríbanse. suscríbanse. Mira, no lo puedo decir bien. Suscríbanse.